Here are this morning's announcements. Be sure to join us today at 10 a.m. directly following this service here in the FLC for a pancake breakfast to support international mission trips. Come enjoy a yummy breakfast while learning more from our teams about what they are planning to accomplish in Belize and Honduras this summer. Donations will support this summer's international mission trips. Reminder, happening next Wednesday, March 2nd, is our Ash Wednesday service that will be held in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. Please plan to join us for this special service as we kick off the season of Lent. First Thursday lunch is this coming Thursday, March 3rd, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We'll serve chicken pie, baked spaghetti, chili dogs, sides, and homemade desserts. To place your order early, please call the church office by tomorrow, Monday, February 28th, to ensure availability. To volunteer, please contact Roger Welke. If you are interested in making any homemade desserts, please contact Ann Kloniger. All proceeds support local children and their families. You are also invited to come and pick chicken this Wednesday, March 2nd at 10 a.m. in the FLC. No experience necessary. Mark your calendars for an exciting upcoming event called the Rawhide Feud. Please plan to join us this coming Saturday, March 5th at 6 p.m. in the FLC for a wonderful dinner and some lighthearted fun. This murder mystery dinner theater is written and being hosted by Roy Lewis, one of our praise team members, and we invite you to come out and participate to try and figure out who done it. This event will include our praise team members as some of the actors as well. Let's get a quick rundown of this hilarious group of characters. Meet Blaze, a rodeo rider who is marrying Dixie, but doesn't know that Dakota is secretly in love with him. Blaze is, however, aware that Colt doesn't like him and knows that Colt doesn't want this marriage to give any property to the Joneses. But Blaze's sister, Cheyenne, who is a horse trainer, but also the bride's high school rival, is mad at Cassidy, who is Dixie, the bride's cousin, who is also at the same wedding where Annie finds someone murdered at which Maverick, our narrator, is gonna walk us through this crazy fun and twisted plot line. And we don't even wanna talk about Savannah. Don't mess with her. Tickets are $20 a piece for all ages. The deadline to register is tomorrow, Monday, February 28th. So be sure to register on our website and reserve your seat today. It's that time of year again. Launch 2022 is beginning next Sunday, March 6th. Launch is our confirmation class here at DUMC, and it is open to students grades 6th through 12th who have never been confirmed. We are so excited to help our students understand the foundations of faith and the history of the body of Christ. Launch will meet on Sunday mornings from 10 to 11 a.m. in the chapel from March 6th through May 29th, except for Easter Sunday. Please contact Ben Nobles if you have any questions. Calling all men. Remember, the men's retreat is happening in two weeks, March 11th through 13th, but be sure to register by tomorrow, Monday, February 28th, to be in a drawing for an awesome gift. Contact David Washko with any questions. Well, good morning, maybe. Good morning. Let's stand. Let's sing together.
darkness shine on me shine So our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here by our lives, tell the story, shine on me, shine. again. Welcome this morning. We are so excited to be here to worship our Lord and Savior, whether you're joining us online or in person. We come for the same reason. We are excited to be here on this Transfiguration Sunday. Would you continue into worship with us?
Let's sing this part together. Chains fall, fear bow here now. Jesus, you change everything. seated. Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well. My name is Steve Autry. I have the privilege of being the senior pastor here. I want to welcome everyone and I realize fully that I'm all that's standing between you and pancakes. So we'll try to get on with this. Uh, no, thank you for being here for coming out to worship. For those of you who are joining us online, we appreciate you giving us the time also to be a part of what is happening in this space this day. One of the things we have going on this weekend is a women's retreat. We have over 30 women who have uh, intentionally made time in their schedule to go away and draw closer to the Lord. And so just want to lift that up and thank you for being the kind of congregation that supports the overall ministries of the church that allows that. Last week, we had a youth retreat. This weekend, women's retreat. Coming up in um, a week or so, a week from next weekend, will be our men's retreat. So opportunities to dig deeper and to step into a space with other people to grow closer to God. And again, thank you for supporting the work of the church. One of the ways that we do that, the primary way that we do that is by giving back to God. I'd like to invite those who will be collecting offering this morning to please come up. And then um, we'll simply pass the baskets. I wanted Erin to get shopping, at, like the uh, you know laundry baskets, but she didn't. She got these. Uh, but just please uh, give back to God as God has blessed you. Thank you so much.
showed me grace at the cross where you died for me and his glory appears like the light from the sun you bow with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly God, this morning we just come to you in awe and wonder, and we praise you for every blessing you have given us and all of the things that you are working on for us right now that we can't see. Lord, let your glory be shown through this service today. Let your Holy Spirit fill this place. Let us focus solely on you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Double checking to make sure the mic is right. This morning at the 815 service, I forgot to mute it, which meant that the first hymn uh, was broadcast out into the narthex by me. And after the service, our, one of our ushers, Linda, came up to me and she goes, I heard you singing this morning. I thought, that can't be good. Can't be good at all. So let's go ahead and get this out of the way. Woo. It's okay, go ahead, go ahead. You can, it's one of those days, right? It's one of those days where 
You wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, I could just stay in bed. Um, don't, don't tell me none of you thought of that, right? I just, oh, it's so nice here in the rain. I could just sleep. I know it was in almost everybody's mind this morning. And I know pancakes cooking in the background, rain falling outside, it's dark, and yeah, I get it. I've been in the, in the pew before, so I understand. But as we read today's text, I want you to hear about who didn't fall asleep, even though they wanted to. And I have, I know this surprises all of you, this will be a complete shock. There have been people who have fallen asleep even while I preached. <laughs> I, I served a church years ago um, that had all of, well, it was a small church. Um, the attendance on Sunday morning would, would range from 18 to 22 people. And when there are that few people in a relatively small space, uh, you can tell who's there, who's not, and you can tell who falls asleep and who doesn't. There was one gentleman every Sunday, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter if I had like a, a great sermon or whether I just, eh, sermon. He would fall asleep, almost right on cue. Right when I would get up to open the Bible, he would sit on the back, uh, on the side aisle in the back, and as soon as I, I started talking, he was out. I must have been magic for him. Uh, every Sunday he would do this. But then he had this amazing ability to wake up right at the end uh, because he was the guy who rang the bell to make sure everybody got, went home afterwards. So he, he, did, he slept through every Sunday, but he was going to make sure everybody got to go home. So that was his spiritual gift, I guess. Today, I do want you to listen for who was challenged with sleep but who remained awake and what their remaining awake meant for their experience. Um, today is the Sunday that we call Transfiguration Sunday in the church. It, is, it marks the end of the season of Epiphany. Now, so we have Christmas. We all get Christmas, right? Well, Christmas ends on uh, January 6th. That is Epiphany Sunday. That's the day that, that God, that Jesus is revealed. That's typically why you have the three wise men be the story of that day because God is recognized by the world. An Epiphany, right? And then you have the Sundays after the Epiphany that then lead up to the season of Lent. Lent being 40 days prior to Easter that's used as a time of spiritual preparation for Easter. We will have Ash Wednesday this Wednesday at 7 p.m. to begin our journey into Lent. The final Sunday before Lent is always Transfiguration Sunday. That's a, that's a big fancy word. And what that means is it, it's the time we celebrate Jesus going up on the mountain and being changed. Being changed into and, and showing a sign of his glory, of reflecting heaven. Uh, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So again, Transfiguration Sunday, listen for who manages to stay awake. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. 
When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent in those days, and they told no one any of the things they had seen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would once again reveal yourself to us as you will. This morning we ask that you would speak to us through your word as recorded for us by your servant Luke. That we may hear and that we may be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. In high school, I had chemistry taught by a really wonderful man, Mr. Mooney. He was such a nice, nice guy. Almost too nice to be a teacher. You ever had one of those? And he um, unfortunately suffered from uh, trouble with his eyesight. Didn't see very well. Um, had to wear uh, thick corrective lenses, uh, even to see almost what was right in front of him. He, he couldn't see past the first or second row of students. Uh, in the back, we, and we were seated at tables for this particular class, and it was a relatively dark classroom. My friend Jeff Randolph sat. Well, let me put it this way. That's where Jeff went to sleep every day. And he really did. He would, he would just lay, actually lay down his head and just go to sleep. And I don't think Mr. Mooney ever knew it. Uh, and while he slept, uh, another friend of mine who sat at that table, Nikki Banks, would take white out. Remember the old white out that you paint on and would paint his fingernails white? So that pretty much every day, Jeff went the rest of the day with white fingernails. I wonder if he'd stayed awake if he had learned any, if he would have learned anything about chemistry. I, I don't know if that would have mattered to his life or not. But I know this much, that because he was asleep every day, he didn't learn anything that Mr. Mooney was trying to teach him. Uh, it's interesting to me that James and John, get, they get chosen, the select of the select, right? This is, this is not far, not long after Jesus has chosen the twelve. But then out of the twelve, he selects three. And you would think, okay, well, there's... We're down to 12. Now, now he's taking us three. This has to be pretty important. And they go on a, a hiking trip. They climb a mountain. Uh, there's debate over what, where exactly this is, how high it was. But what we do know is that anytime uh, a mountain shows up in the Bible, you need to pay attention to it. Remember, that's where Moses goes in the Old Testament to receive the law, Mount Sinai. Jesus goes up to the mountain and James and John and Peter, uh, they've got to be thinking, this is, this is different, right? This is different. What does, what's going on with this? But they get up there and they are weighted down with sleep. Have you ever been there? I, I, I know you have, where you just can't hold your eyes open. I remember when Maggie was little and New Year's Eve would roll around and she would say to me, Dad, I want to stay up and see the ball drop. And I would be like, I don't want to stay up and see the ball drop. But she would. And she's just, I'm going to stay awake. I'm going to stay awake. We're going to stay awake till the new year comes. And, uh, you know, the rest of the story, she, she just couldn't. Sometime, you know, 9 o'clock, those little eyes get a little heavy. And by 9.30, she would be out. And then I'd take her into bed and put her in bed. And then the next morning, she'd be, Dad, why didn't you wake me up? And that would be because I went to sleep too, honey. I went to sleep too. Um, you know what it feels like to be weighted down with sleep. Maybe on a long drive and you know you can't fall asleep. But you feel the weight of it. Or on a long day and weighted down with sleep. You just want to give in to it. You just want to let it overtake you and lose yourself in it. It's a very human response. And I, which I think is, is interesting that that very human need comes into this text but to James and Peter John to their credit Luke says they did not fall asleep and so they saw Jesus in his glory um, they saw Jesus in his glory because they stayed awake and what they saw was worth staying awake for I bet they were really awake whenever uh, Jesus starts to glow uh, that would get your attention, right? <laughs> Be like, oh, well, what's happening over there? In the midst of Jesus' praying, he is changed before them. 
uh, they, they began to take on this bright appearance. And again, back to Moses in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, it's recorded that when Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, he would go up there and talk with God. And up on that mountain, uh, you would get clouds and lightning and expressions of God's glory and God's power. And after being in God's presence, Moses would come down off the mountain and his very face would glow. Such to the point that he had to put a veil over his face so that he wouldn't scare everybody to death. So God's glory was hard for people to take. So much so that that Moses had to put a veil over the glory that was imparted to him from God. So this shouldn't be a surprise when we know that story, that Jesus actually begins to take on a whole new appearance. And in the midst of this, these disciples who manage to stay awake look and they see Moses and Elijah. It's hard to convey just how important Moses and Elijah would have been to Peter, James, and John. I mean, this is a big deal. Have you you ever been somewhere and you saw somebody who was famous? You ever, you ever done that? And you're like, oh, is that so-and-so? I can't say I've ever really been anywhere where I saw anyone that was all that famous. Although, I remember um, when Marcy and I were on our honeymoon, we went out to dinner at this really, really nice restaurant, and I saw Sherman Hemsley. Anybody know who that is? That's George Jefferson, right? And I was like, is that Sherman Hemsley? That's, 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 you know, I didn't go talk to him. I, I saw how he treated Mr. Willis. I didn't want him to yell at me. <laughs> I mean, that's about as close to fame as I've ever gotten. And that's pretty far away, come to think of it. But Moses is like, wow. Moses is to Israel what George Washington is to the United States of America, only more so. Moses was the one who, first great leader, the one who helped them form their identity, the one who stood in the gap between them and God when God was upset with them. Moses is the one who interceded for them whenever they had made God so mad that God was like, I'm just done, Moses. I'm going to kill them all. I go back and read that. It's an interesting story. Moses goes, well, God, you promised not to. And the Bible does this curious thing, and it says God changed his mind. That's a whole other sermon. <laughs> it's a whole other topic. But Moses, you could see why Moses would really matter. And then Elijah Elijah was the greatest of the prophets. God, Elijah was like a superhero to Israel. He's the one who, who stood up to King Ahab and Jezebel. He's the one who confronted the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel. He's the one who won great victories. And he is the one that the Old Testament says didn't actually die. That Moses was taken, uh, Elijah rather, was taken up in a chariot of fire. And so Peter, James, and John are are going, do you see who that is? And they're talking with Jesus. And they're talking to Jesus about his departure that's to come soon. What is that? Well, that's Jesus going all the way to the cross. That's Jesus carrying out God's will for his life to the point that he's willing to give up his very life for all of us. And so you can imagine why they would be excited. And Peter, stumbling all over himself like he often does, after Moses and Elijah depart from Jesus, he comes stammering up going, Oh my goodness. Let's, let's, we need to build something. We, can we just stay here on top of this mountain? We'll build a dwelling place for you, for Moses, for Elijah. I don't know what what Peter's end game was in that. (laughs) Maybe he was going to sell tickets to visit down in the valley. I, I don't know. But he wants to stay there to dwell in that moment. And Jesus first, I imagine, just looks at him and then this cloud, like it, and again, a cloud came over Sinai. Clouds in the Bible often represent God. The uh, fancy word for that is a theophany. So if you see how God expresses God's self is, is almost always through clouds, through smoke, through fire, like the burning bush. 
like the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. It, it's very clear. This is the very presence of the divine, of the holy, of the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning of the end. And this voice comes out. This is my son. Listen to him. Um, if Peter, James, and John weren't already listening to Jesus, I imagine they were after that. So, so what does this story mean for us? Well, I think a couple things. There's always many meanings and layers of meanings to any text. I hope, and if it's okay, believe me, you ask God what you want God to give you from this text. But what I see in this is this idea that if we want to draw closer to Christ, there are times where we have to simply stay awake. That there's so many things that would distract us, that would take our attention elsewhere. Uh, they're everywhere. You don't have to go far before you're going to find something that's vying for your attention. For Peter, James, and John, well, it was sleep. For us, I mean, you've got a computer in your pocket that's connected to the rest of the world. And all you have to do is take it out and it's going to tell you stuff. Maybe even have a, a watch that, uh, that, that gives you alerts. I've got to fix my watch because every now and then I'll just be walking. Next thing I know is a like, news alert. Oh, I better stop. This watch is going to kill me someday if I don't change that. Because I'm going to be worried about what Kim Kardashian did in the middle of traffic. <laughs> we have so many things that distract us. I mean, some of those things are really good, too. Family, friends. And I'm not, you know, we can easily put those in front of God. But then we have other things that we know are destructive to us. Like climbing down that social media rabbit hole. It's easy to do. Like entertaining ourselves to death. Anybody see that latest series on whatever? And before you know it, you're like, oh my gosh. I just spent the last 12 hours binging something. It's so easy for us to fall asleep, literally and metaphorically. And so if we want to grow close to God and see the things of Christ, we've got to be more intentional than probably ever about how we do that. We've got to carve out time and space to listen and pay attention. Because there's <laughs> lots of things out there that are competing for your attention to draw you somewhere that's much less productive someplace that may even be unhealthy and so as we come into this season of Lent those 40 days are there to help us redirect our attention they're there for us to embark on spiritual disciplines to align us back with God so I'll, I'll just simply invite myself and all of us to use this season to get intentional about listening to Jesus because ultimately that's what the voice of God says it gives Jesus the authority to speak into our lives and authority is a big deal we cede authority to all kinds of other people whether we know it or not and it's fascinating in our modern context about who we listen to and who we don't like you can put someone on TV who has a, a stack of degrees and, and, and PhDs and expertise and experience and people will go, yeah, I don't think so, right? But then you can quote someone who quoted someone else, who quoted a blogger, who quoted his neighbor who's living in his mom's basement and all of a sudden that becomes authoritative. Do, you not, do we not think that's strange? We struggle with who to believe and who to disbelieve. We struggle with who to give authority to and who not to give authority to. The answer 
is Jesus. And I know that, that I mean, you're like, okay, I went, to the, I went to the church today, and that preacher had a great insight. He stood up there and said, well, the answer to your problem is Jesus. And then we ate pancakes. Jesus is Lord. Does that mean anything to us? It, it should, because it means that the teaching of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and the presence of Jesus has authority over us. Has the wisdom to tell us what we should do with our lives. Most of us think Jesus is a really nice guy who gets us to heaven. Jesus happens to be the smartest person who ever lived on the face of this earth. Jesus, believe it or not, he's smarter than Einstein, smarter than Galileo, smarter than all the science departments of all the universities of all the world. He is God. And don't you think that as God, Jesus knows more than anybody else? And beyond that, Jesus' hope is for your best. Jesus deeply wants you to have your best life in the here and now. And he knows how to help you live that life. But we have to stay awake. We have to be vigilant. We have to pay attention and listen to him. Because at the end of this, all of this is about coming down to this verse where the, out of the cloud the voice says, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. That's going to become very, very important when James and Peter and John move on to lead the church. It's going to become crucial that they reflect the teachings of Jesus back to this community that Christ has established through the strength of his Holy Spirit. And it's going to be their listening to what Jesus has told them that changes the world. In John's gospel, Jesus says, I've got to go away. But one who's coming after me, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will come and empower you, teach you everything that I have said to you, and you will do greater works than me. We carry out that same direction. Will we listen? And will we stay awake long enough to hear it? That's our challenge. But it's also our invitation to be able to move away from chaos, fear, the manipulation of our culture into a life that does indeed shine with God's goodness. That's what we're all invited to. All we have to do is stay awake. I hope and pray we can do that. Let us pray. Lord, this day, we are grateful. Grateful for your love, your care, your blessing. Grateful for your word. I pray that we may um, be vigilant, that we may pay attention, that we may be on the lookout for where you step into our lives and that we may give you authority over our lives because you really do know how to help us live our best life here and now. Grant us this wisdom, I pray. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand, and I'm going to say a blessing over the pancakes. <laughs> so let us pray. Lord, this day, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for food that is provided, for the, those, the mission trips that will go to support. We thank you for your goodness. And so help us this day. Uh, Bless this food, bless us, and may we go and be a blessing to others in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.